Hi, I'm Ashton, and I apologize for the different lighting, different background. I'm dog-sitting this weekend, hence the unfamiliar dog in the background. Hi, Doak. <laughs> but uh, yesterday, I spent the whole day reading slash finishing this book. It was so good, and I really want to do a book review on it, so that's what this is. So, I wish you all the best by Mason Deaver. Jack, my boyfriend, and I enjoy spending time at Barnes & Noble together as like a kind of informal date type thing. Um, so I saw this book on the LGBT table section and I'd seen hype around it on social media. I knew that the author was in North Carolina, which is where I live. And I was just like, ooh, I've been wanting to read that. So of course Jack was like, well, I have a gift card. I'm buying it for you. And I was like, no, you're not. And he's like, you can't stop me. And I was like, fuck you. But Jack got me this book because he had a gift card and I'm gonna force him to read it because I loved it so much but I wanted to give you a review first. This is going to be a spoiler-free review because I would highly recommend that you read it. Like many of my other trans book reviews, I'm going to start with the background and my feelings about the book before I read it, then I'm going to go into the good, then I'm going to talk about the things that I was unsure about with the book, whether that's like plot things, character things, writing things, whatever, then I'm going to talk about the bad. However, for this book, I have literally no hard criticisms. <laughs> I have some criticisms that I've put in the unsure section, but there was nothing for me that genuinely made it a bad book. Um, so for the bad section, instead of talking about my criticisms, I'm going to address some of the critiques that I've seen from other people. So I definitely saw some social media hype around this book that made me excited about it. Um, I saw a lot of like, oh, the cover is so fucking cute, and it is, like, look at this cover art. I adore it. It is beautiful. It's just so good. The, the cover as a whole is just very well designed, and I really appreciate that aspect of it. As for the actual book, there was especially hype around it because it features a non-binary main character, and it was written by a non-binary person, which is really cool. And for the record, said non-binary person is extremely cute. Mason apparently likes baking and gardening, and they're just extremely cute, and I support them wholeheartedly. So when we checked out from the Barnes & Noble that Jack and I were at, the lady at the checkout noticed this book, and she was like, oh, you know, the, the person that wrote that works here. And I was like, what the fuck? So apparently Mason works at the bookstore that I got this from, um, which is fucking wild, and maybe I'll see them there someday, I don't know. But yeah, I bought this book from the bookstore where the author works which is kind of rad. Last thing before I get into my review, I'm going to read you the little synopsis because I don't want to spoil anything and I feel like reading the synopsis will kind of give you a bit of the context without, you know, saying anything that you wouldn't know just from reading the synopsis. So it's just three words. I am non-binary, but that's all it takes to change everything. When Ben DeBacker comes out to their parents, they're thrown out of their house and forced to move in with their estranged older sister, Hannah, and her husband, Thomas, whom Ben has never met. Struggling with an anxiety disorder compounded by their parents' rejection, they come out only to Hannah, Thomas, and their therapist, and try to keep a low profile at a new school. But Ben's attempts to survive the last half of senior year unnoticed are thwarted when Nathan Allen, a funny and charismatic student, decides to take Ben under his wing. As Ben and Nathan's friendship grows, their feelings begin to change, and what started as a disastrous turn of events looks like it might just be a chance to start a happier, new life. As it turns heartbreaking and joyous, I wish you all the best is both a celebration of life friendship and love, and a shining example of hope in the face of adversity. I would consider this book young adult realistic fiction with a romantic subplot. Um, it's hard to really put books like this in a single genre, so I guess I would just go with young adult fiction if I had to. Also let it be said that I'm not the biggest fan of young adult fiction. I like reading stuff like memoirs when it comes to stories, I like reading political philosophy. If you want to follow me on Goodreads, you can see more of what I like to read, but Typically, this is not the type of book that I would read. If this was completely cishet, I wouldn't have even given it a second glance. That said, there is so much queer rep that I just can't ignore this book and I had to do a trans book review on it. So now that we've got that background down, um, now that you know kind of what I was expecting from it, I want to get into the good aspects of the story. So first of all, this book gave me emotional whiplash. Um, and sometimes this can be a good thing, sometimes it's gonna be a bad thing. But overall, the emotions that this book put me through, I would say 
were very refreshing. Like even when they weren't good emotions, I felt very like fulfilled and emotional in a good intense way, not in a this is trauma porn intense way, you know? I talked about a similar thing with the last trans book I reviewed, which was Symptoms of Being Human, which also featured a non-binary character, but that book definitely had more of a trauma porn feel to me. I cried reading that book, it was a very emotionally intense book, but it was done in what I think is a much less tasteful way than I Wish You All The Best was done. Um, and that could also definitely be because I Wish You All The Best is by a non-binary person, whereas Symptoms Being Human is by a cishet man. Um, so, you know, just keeping that in mind. Hi bud, come to join me? Hi sweetheart. <laughs> Aww. So as for the like hyper emotional aspect of this book, did it exist? Yes, but I believe it was done in a more tasteful way than some other books I've seen about trans folks. That said, I did cry multiple times. If you're not looking for a book that takes you on an emotional roller coaster, don't read it. But I like books that take me on an emotional roller coaster. Another thing that I really appreciated was that Deaver used the terms F word and T word instead of saying the actual slurs that they represent, which I highly appreciated. A big issue that I've had. <laughs> I am not a fan of books that use slurs without any sort of like disclaimer or warning or at least discussion of what the impact of that slur is. And the way that this book did it for the most part was very good. That said, they use the word queer quite liberally, which I'm okay with because it's something that I use to reclaim for myself. Video essay on the topic coming soon. Um, but I know that it can make others uncomfortable, and if queer is a word that you aren't comfortable reclaiming for yourself, or that you aren't comfortable seeing others reclaim, this might not be the book for you, just because that is used very, very liberally, and as an identifier quite commonly. Another LGBT-related thing that I really, really appreciated was that Deaver used the term um, correct pronouns, or like right pronouns, instead of preferred pronouns, which is something that I thought was empowering, good, a very nice way of letting uh, cis people reading this know that pronouns aren't something that are preferred, they're just something that is right. It's definitely a pet peeve of mine when people use preferred pronouns as like an excuse for, well, it's preferred, it's not like mandatory. Um, that's definitely something that I've seen transphobes use as like a talking point, which is annoying. And I personally, as a trans person, I'm just a lot more comfortable with my pronouns being referred to as my pronouns or the correct pronouns for me, as opposed to just my preferred pronouns because it sounds condescending and belittling, right? So I'm not gonna say um, who this trope applies to, but I am gonna acknowledge that it exists. So the whole like romance interest thing happens where like you go to a new school and your romantic interest like shows you around. I just feel like that's a very, very common trope and like some people might be not so happy about that, but honestly, I loved it. It was so pure, it was so good. And I don't know why, but one of my favorite things in queer young adult novels is when tropes that are predominantly used as cishet things in YA novels are like twisted into a queer way, which this book did quite a lot and I was so happy with that. Is it cliche? Is it a YA trope? Yes. Do I love it? Also yes. I also really appreciated how this book explored how the little things can sometimes be the most impactful things when it comes to dysphoria and when it comes to being trans or even non-binary. Ben, who's the main character, talks about multiple times how the, the little things that are misgendering can build up and feel worse and worse and like those things really stood out to me as very genuine trans experiences because dysphoria and discomfort with your body in general as a trans person isn't always like a huge overwhelming thing. Dysphoria can be as subtle as just the cringe or like the tenseness you feel when people misgender you. And I feel like that was explored very, very well in this book. Something about being trans that is oftentimes for me the hardest to express is how much the seemingly little things can matter. And I felt that this book explored that really, really well. Another thing that I liked was that Ben is comfortable with reclaiming the word queer and kind of has to be taught that others aren't. 
Um, I thought that was a really like interesting and unique queer focused aspect of character development that you, you know, couldn't get in a cishet focused book. That said, like I mentioned in the beginning, the use of queer is very all over the place during the book, and if it's not a word that you're comfortable with reading or reclaiming for yourself, then this might not be the book for you. Um, and I do wish that that was maybe discussed in a little bit more detail. Um, that said, I've been doing a shit ton of research on the word queer and its politics and, it his and its history recently for that video essay that I mentioned. So for me, it's a bit more of a topic that I'm very hyper aware of, you know, so it may not be as prevalent as I thought it was, but it's still something that I definitely noticed. Another thing that I really liked was the kind of discussion about sexuality that Ben has. It's kind of an ongoing discussion through the... It's kind of an ongoing discussion through the whole book, so obviously I can't really summarize all of it, that would be spoilers, but they do explore here at the book how labeling yourself can be especially difficult when you're non-binary because it feels like things apply to you in different ways. It allows for some exploration about the topic of bisexuality and about how queer can be used as a very nice umbrella for people that aren't sure how to label themselves, and it's just a really interesting way of taking, like, discussions that happen in the queer community and putting them into a story in a very natural feeling way. Something that I think was probably one of the most important aspects of the book to me was the discussion about how cutting people off can be a healthy decision and doesn't have to be guilt-driven. Again, I'm not going to give you any specifics because I do want this to be spoilers-free, but there are people in the book that Ben has to cut out of their life and they do that in a very healthy way. And at one point, let's see, page 291, I think. I wrote down page 291 where Ben says, now I know for certain, they don't deserve my love and I sure as hell don't need theirs. That was just something that I appreciated as a topic because when people don't accept you for whatever LGBT plus identity you happen to fall under, they don't deserve your love and you're never obligated to give anyone any part of you if they don't respect every part of you. And that's kind of what Ben went through. And I really, really liked that a kind of defining character moment for them was when they decided that their non-binariness and their worth and their comfort come from a place that does involve them being non-binary. And if there are people in their life that are disrespectful of that, then Ben deserves better. And I liked that they recognized that and that that was kind of a moment of character growth where they were like, you know what? Fuck you. You don't respect that part of me. You don't respect all of me and you're not gonna be allowed to be in my life. I think as a message for young LGBT kids, that can be really important. It is important to talk about how coming out isn't always safe as Ben experienced as you know from the synopsis and tumultuous relationships can happen. That can be okay. But I also believe that it's important for LGBT kids to know that if somebody isn't willing to put in the effort to respect every last part of you, then you deserve better. That's another message that was kind of prevalent throughout the book and another one that I really thought was important. I'm just glad that cutting transphobic people out of your life is kind of seen as a power move in this book. Like, I'm glad that it was shown in a positive way where like, this is a thing that can be healthy and can be good. All right, last thing before I move on to the things that I'm unsure about, um, good, pure, non-binary friendship. So Miriam is a character that's introduced relatively early on in the book, and they're also non-binary, like Ben. They're somebody that Ben looks up to as like a non-binary big sibling. They also wear a hijab, which is cool. Um, they have a YouTube channel where they talk about like their intersections with them as someone who also wears a hijab, and as someone who is not white, and like all sorts of different things. Um, I would have liked that to be explored a bit more because that is something that, like, I'm interested in. And Miriam was a character that I wanted to know more about, but I get why they weren't as heavily involved as they were, and I thought that the amount that they were incorporated was appropriate. But I thought that the friendship between them and Ben was just really pure and really lovely. A lot of the times the only relationships explored in books are the romantic ones, but I feel like this book did a really good job of developing Ben and Miriam's friendship, and I liked that a lot. That said, I definitely would have appreciated some more character development on Miriam's part. Them as a character seems to be very one note in a way. They exist, they're doing cool things online, and they talk to Ben about Ben's issues. 
And I get that sometimes a character like that is needed, but I wish that they'd had a bit more dimension. And not to spoil anything, but they do get more dimension as we move towards the end of the book, but it's still someone that I would have liked to see more character out of. I'm not gonna say they were a bad or underdeveloped character, but I would have liked more. And I guess that's a good transition into what I call the unsure section, things that I either liked at first and then hated, or things that I hated and then liked, or things that I'm just not sure where to put. And at the top of that list is the use of NB, E-N-B-Y, as a catch-all. It's only used twice that I caught on page 46 and on page 49. On the message boards, I found many NB people ask their brothers and sisters to call them Sid, short for sibling. And then, not that there's anything wrong with those kinds of NB people. So in both of these cases, it appears that Deaver is using NB as a catch-all as an umbrella for all non-binary people, and I know quite a few non-binary people who don't like being called NB. I personally don't mind it for myself, but it's definitely not a common enough or a well-accepted enough term to cover all non-binary or genderqueer people. There are a lot of non-binary people that see it as infantilizing, and it's just not something that the community as a whole has like accepted yet, the way that most non-binary people are comfortable being called non-binary people, not most non-binary people are comfortable being called NB. I just saw that as a little bit weird, not something that I enjoyed. Something else that I found very odd um, and unrealistic in a way was Ben's unsureness about starting therapy. So this isn't a spoiler, because um, it's really early on in the book and I feel like it's not like a huge plot point to begin with, but Ben's sister who they're staying with offers Ben offers Ben a therapist and um, she talks about how this therapist like specializes in LGBT kids and seems like really cool and Ben at first is really really scared to go. It's partly because of his anxiety and partly because of other issues that aren't explored very well at all. But I just found that really odd. With the extent of the trans and non-binary kids I know and the trans and non-binary kids I've gotten comments from, it seems like a very widely held consensus that most trans and non-binary kids would jump at the chance to see a therapist that specializes in LGBT kids. Like that's a privilege that not all trans kids have and when it's offered to Ben, I would have expected that they were gonna jump at the chance. Like that's something that everybody that I know would be really appreciative of. It just didn't seem realistic to me because even the trans kids that I know that have anxiety, the majority of us would still be extremely grateful to see a mental health professional that specializes in trans things. Let me know if you've experienced something different, but that's generally what I've seen and I thought that it was a bit of a weird thing that went on. From a writing standpoint, this book wasn't like exceptional, but it was good enough for a young adult novel. But one thing that did bother me that I'm unsure about was a lot of the dialogue is very unrealistic. Ben uses um in texts, which I haven't seen people do ever, and maybe I just don't text the right people, but like generally when I'm texting I've never felt like I should type out um. It is something that I say when I'm talking, but it's not something that I would put into a text. I just thought that was odd and unrealistic, and maybe it's just because it's something that I was reading and it like stood out, but it was just not something that felt real to me. It felt contrived and it felt written when I feel like book dialogue is supposed to feel like it's something that could actually become a conversation. And then the other example that I wrote down wasn't through text, it was in like an actual bit of dialogue. This is in a quote, I'm sorry, Ben, I'm so sorry. Skip one paragraph. I'm sorry, Hannah, I'm so sorry. People don't talk like that. For one character to format an apology that way, and then for the next line of dialogue to be the exact same thing is weird. I don't think people talk like that. Like I've never, I don't know, like even when you're in like a heartfelt emotional apology, you don't apologize the exact same way as another person. And maybe that was just used to emphasize the fact that they're siblings, but it didn't seem realistic. I've never talked to anybody that way. Those were the only two examples that I like wrote down as things that I could talk about, but the dialogue throughout the book in a few places was kind of unnatural and seemed very contrived as opposed to dialogue that you could actually have with a person. But this is also Mason's first actual novel that they've written themselves, so I can't really blame them for like not having perfect writing. 
The writing itself was mediocre at best, but everything else about the book did kind of make up for it in my opinion. Um, I just did want to point out that the dialogue throughout the book is kind of messy and unrealistic, but some people don't mind that, some people do. I just wanted to put that out there. Another thing that I put on my unsure list is just that the chapters are really, really short. Some of them are like three pages, but I'd say the average length is probably about 10 pages. I just did the math and it's actually 12.96 pages, but like close enough. Um, and I got through each chapter really, really quickly, which for me kind of threw off the reading experience a bit. I feel like it just would have been easier for me to read if the chapters were longer. But also keep in mind that I read really, really quickly, like 100 pages an hour, and I totally am able to like digest everything that's written. So that could just be a me thing, I don't know. But it did bother me a little bit because it felt like every 30 seconds it was like a new chapter, which kind of threw me off. Like, cause when I get, you know, chapter 12, I'm just kind of like, oh, I am reading a book, you know? It feels less immersive when there are chapter breaks so very often. But again, that is a very, like, personal critique. Like, not everybody's gonna care about that. And not everybody reads as damn quickly as I do. I also understand that it's a YA book, so it's supposed to be kind of easy to read and easy to get through, and it is. But for me, that just made me read it very, very quickly, and the chapters kind of rolled by really quickly, too. So that was something that I wasn't entirely in love with, but again, it's not something that I really cared about too much. One thing that is, like, related to LGBT content as well that I really didn't like was that Deaver equated touch aversion to aromanticism and asexuality, which isn't very accurate. Page 183. Touch aversion can be common in people who deal with panic attacks or people dealing with anxiety. That part's true. In fact, there are some people who are just born or developed that way, like asexual or aromantic people. Yes, there are asexual and aromantic people that have touch aversions, but not all of them do. I'm demisexual myself, so I'm on like the asexual spectrum type thing, and I don't have touch aversions until I'm dealing with major anxiety or major sensory overload. That said, I'm not like fully asexual, but from the asexual people I know, from the aromantic people I know, there is a wide variety in how you can be asexual or aromantic. There are ace and aero people that love being touched, there are ace and aero people that really like affectionate touches from platonic friends, and it's a complex topic that can't just be summed up with those people have touch aversions. They don't always, you can't blanket statement that in the way that Deaver did. I definitely didn't like that. That was something that threw me off a lot, especially because it was being presented through the lens of a therapist. Are there ace and people with touch aversions? Yes, I'm sure there are, but those two things aren't synonymous, and the way that it was presented made it seem like it was, which was very weird and very misrepresentation-y. I didn't like that. My last critique is just about the characters. Um, a couple of the characters I wish would have had more development, and I get that this is a YA book and there's not all the room in the world to just go on about your characters, but I would have read a hundred more pages if I could have had a more in-depth understanding of Nathan's character, of Sophie's character. Nathan, even though he's one of the main characters, seems like he's a flawless character, like he doesn't do anything wrong ever, and I love him and I love him as a person and I want to love him, obviously, but I just wish he would have had a stronger development. I feel like Ben was developed really well, I feel like Miriam was developed relatively well, as I talked about in the past, but there were characters that I just wish would have had a stronger character basis. And again, this is Deaver's first book, I'm not gonna blame them for something small like that. It may bother other people more than it bothered me, but in general, I just wish the characters had been more solid as a whole, and I wish all of them would have been as well developed as Ben was. Okay, now I'm going to address some critiques that I saw in the reviews on Goodreads. Something that I saw quite a lot was the book is really cliche. Is it a cliche, like, friends to lovers, like, romance subplot in a young adult novel? Yes, maybe. Do I love it? Yes. I do not care that it is cliche, it is fucking cute, and I'm not ashamed of liking it. I'm also a sucker for when authors take common YA tropes and kind of flip them on the heads, like Deaver did with all of these, like, romance tropes, with, like, this is not a cishet relationship, you know? So were there a lot of cliches used? Yes, but I didn't mind because it flipped a lot of those cliches on the head when it comes to heteronormativity, and I thought they were used in a really, really cute way, and they were integrated into the story very well. So I didn't mind that too much. Another critique that I saw in a couple of reviews was that it doesn't explain what being non-binary is like, 
And I would argue with that. First of all, I don't think a book like this has to explain what being non-binary is like in order for it to be valid or good representation. It's difficult to explain how being non-binary feels in the same way it's difficult to explain how being a man feels or how being a woman feels because those things aren't concretely defined and it is different for everybody. I wouldn't have been opposed to more exploration of Ben's identity, but I felt that there was an appropriate amount considering the length of the book and considering the rest of the subject matter of the book. And and I don't think that a character has to justify themselves to exist the way that they do. Like imagine if I was writing a book review for any random book with a cisgender main character and I was like, okay, well, it was a good book, but I would have liked if the author explained more what it's like to be cisgender because I don't know. You know, like it's, it's weird. I don't feel that Ben should have to explain themselves to be like a valid non-binary person or like a good non-binary character. Non-binary characters can just be non-binary without having to explain it. Like, nobody's ever obligated to explain who they are, and I feel like that should extend to fictional characters. Like, not every book about a trans person has to be about them discovering themselves or about them transitioning, and this one isn't, and I liked that. At the end of the day, if you're not non-binary, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to understand what being non-binary is like, because it is different for everybody. And I feel like this book did a good job of exploring how one non-binary person's life can be completely unique and different compared to another non-binary person's life. And that's a message that I felt like this book put forward relatively successfully. And I wish that the person who wrote that review would understand that there's no way that someone could explain how it feels to be non-binary without excluding some other non-binary people because there is no singular definition. It's like with any gender. Gender is something very personal and very social and intrapersonal and not something that is very easy to explain how it feels to be, you know? A few of the people in Goodreads that rated it lowly also talked about like how messy the writing style was and how amateur it seemed and that I can kind of agree with but I feel like it's good enough for a YA book. I don't think YA books need to be like stellar examples of writing and for me the plot and the characters and the representation that this book offered more than made up for the sometimes messy sometimes amateur writing. Okay I think that covers all of it. So Overall, I wish you all the best by Mason Deaver. Do I recommend it if you are ready for an emotional roller coaster of a YA book with a really cute and really pure romantic subplot and really lovely relationships in general and a really cool non-binary rep and, and a very diverse cast of characters when it comes to race, gender? Yes. If you are ready to cry, read it. If you are ready to read a really fucking beautiful queer relationship develop, read it. But if you're going to be nitpicking the writing, maybe give it a pass. That said, overall, I really like this book. I will probably read it again, but first I'm going to force my boyfriend to read it because I want to be gay with him. Because I'm soft and gay about this book and I want him to understand. If you've read this book, please tell me what your thoughts are in the comments. I want to be soft and queer with all of you guys. I feel like that was the overall mood of this book for me, soft and queer. All right, I'm gonna go make myself lunch. Goodbye, I hope that you find a book or some piece of media that you feel represents you in the most genuine way possible, and I will talk to you later, maybe.